Hello, and welcome to TREACH Online Worship. We are so glad you're with us. We want to connect with you and know you're here. So please take a moment to scan the QR code on the screen, or you can go to our website, tmumc.org. We want to connect with you and be your church. You know, last week we finished our series entitled Live Simply, Love Generously. And today we're excited to begin a new worship series and it's simply called Revelation. You know, most Protestant Bibles are made up of 66 books. And I dare say, probably the most misunderstood, the most fearful book in our scripture is Revelation. People are scared to read it, myself included, because there's lots of rich imagery and it can inspire confusion and doubt. In this series, over the next three weeks, Pastor Daniel is gonna lead us through all 22 chapters in the book of Revelation, a book that inspires hope, that reminds us that God is to be worshiped and adored, and God has all things in God's control. I'm excited about it and hope you are too. So tune in now as we study together the book of Revelation. What do you know about the book of Revelation? Confusion. Frustration. Fear. Trials. Suffering. Condemnation. Judgment. What if Revelation is actually a book of celebration and hope? Come discover the hope of Revelation. Hey friends, it's great to be with you as we start this new worship series simply called Revelation, about the book of Revelation, this powerful gift to us about celebration and hope that looks to the future. And so I'm really excited you're with us and hope that you've invited some friends or family or work colleagues uh, to join you online, either with you or in their own homes or places of work. Uh, we're just excited and so I'm glad you're here. Will you join me in prayer as we begin our time together? Holy and gracious God, what a gift your book is. What a wonderful opportunity it is to study John's revelation and how it has impact on who we are and what we do in our everyday world, even today. So Lord, I pray for um, your guidance, your wisdom, your insight, and certainly your Holy Spirit as we seek to honor you and to be better discover uh, John's revelation for our world and for our purposes this day. May we be guided by your spirit, Lord, and may we honor you in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, here we are. Hard to believe, right? We've been planning and, and trying to get together, and now we've arrived at the book of Revelation. And it's a fun book, but it's a challenging book, isn't it? I, I know if you are like me, and certainly like most people you know, it, has lo it generates lots of questions, doesn't it? all kinds of thoughts and images and wonderings and musings about, golly, what does this stuff mean? And why is it even here? And why maybe even should we study it, right? One of the things we've come to recognize over the last couple of years, in fact, here at Treach, is that one of the more uh, common things we get are people coming to us with questions digitally about the book of Revelation. Um, they're, they're broad sometimes, but they come to us in very simple ways. In search engine uh, discoveries, we get people coming to us asking questions like, are we in end times? Who is the Antichrist? And what's fascinating about that particular one is there are three names that always pop up. One of these three names that always pop up with who is the Antichrist. It's either Obama, Trump, or Biden. Isn't that funny? that whoever may be the current president or maybe even past presidents seems to be, golly, is this the Antichrist? 
There are questions that often come up about, golly, or what is the rapture and how does that work? And is that possible? What is the timeline of the book of Revelation? These are all search engine discoveries that place people at our website. And so part of what we discovered was, man, let's talk about this stuff. People are clearly interested in it, right? Well, a couple of parameters as we begin. One is in a three-week worship series, I can't possibly cover the totality of the book. Uh, so we're going to do some highlights. We're going to do uh, what I call meta themes uh, that will help guide us through a better understanding of the book of Revelation. And let me also give this disclaimer. I know a heck of a lot more about the Gospels of Jesus Christ and the letters of Paul than I do about Revelation, but I'm excited to walk through it with you and to discover the great imagery that it has for us about life and faith and moving through difficult times. So let me kind of lay out real briefly what we're going to try to do over these next three weeks. Today, going to be what I just call an intro, an overview, a, a discovery of kind of purpose behind the book. Next week, we're going to talk about, um, golly, how do we overcome uh, struggles and, and difficulties? Because that's the major theme of this book. And then finally, in our last week, we're going to talk about how we have victory in Christ and how God's great order has come back into play and Revelation tries to help us better understand that. So I'm glad you're with us, and I hope you'll find this both helpful and uh, purposeful for you in your faith development. So let's get started with this book that is so unique. It is, in fact, the most unique and distinctive book in all of the scriptures. In all of the 66 books, this one stands out as the most unique uh, in all of both Old and New Testament. So I'm just going to read a couple of passages to kind of get us started. Right off the top, John, the revealer, uh, helps us to understand his purpose. It says this in John chapter 1, first couple of verses. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must take place soon. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near." So we hear that this is a revelation to John. It is, by the way, a singular revelation. So anytime we talk about the book of Revelation, we never put an S on it. It's not plural. It's the singular revelation to John. And, and what is a revelation? Well, a revelation is also known as an apocalypse. That is to say, it's, a, it's a something about what's to come. And so uh, revelation or apocalypse literally means an unveiling or um, kind of an uncovering. And so what John is telling us at the very beginning is Jesus has come to him and he's revealed or uncovered or, or, or sort of um, unveiled this information, this understanding, and John's going to write it to us, right? And, and so part of what we know is um, a guy named John wrote this book, right? Early on, many scholars assumed it was the guy who wrote the Gospel of John, but what we've come to discover, and most scholars agree, is it's a different John, uh, sometimes commonly referred to as John the Elder. And, and he is on the island of Patmos. I'll speak more to that in just a minute. Uh, and he is writing this vision, this revelation to the churches in the region to help them better understand how they can be faithful and continue to persevere. And he's writing it very late in the first century. Initially, some scholars thought it might have been around 69 AD, but most scholars now agree that John is writing very late, probably around 95 or 96 AD, during the reign of the emperor Domitian. Both Nero, a predecessor of Domitian, and Domitian are very harsh rulers. Uh, they, in fact, begin to persecute Christians because they believe, as the ruler, they are God. They would demand and require that people in the Roman Empire would refer to them as Lord, as Savior, as God. And so if you were a follower of Jesus, if you were a Christian and you were following God and you committed to Jesus as Lord, you were considered in the Roman Empire an atheist because you were not calling Domitian and following Domitian as Lord. So here's what's also unique about this. So we know it's a revelation, John tells us that, but it's also, in, interestingly enough, a letter. 
And we know that because of this structure. Look at these couple of verses uh, uh, continuing on in the book. Uh, John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. This is a format that Paul and uh, Timothy and uh, Peter would often use in their letters. And so what a part of what makes this book so distinct is it's a revelation or an apocalypse, but it's also a letter. And it comes in the form of a letter to these seven churches. And John is simply trying to reveal to them this vision, this um, uh, thing that he's witnessed, right? And so John becomes sort of in a trance and he is caught up in the spirit and he begins to write stuff like this. Listen, beginning in verse 9. I, John, your brother, who share with you in Jesus the persecution and the kingdom and the patient endurance, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice with a trumpet saying, Write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches in Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, I saw one like the Son of God, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash across his chest." Well, you begin to get the picture that there is this vivid imagery, right, that John is writing. And when he says he's in the Spirit, he's very clear that somehow he's wrapped up and engulfed in a spiritual experience. And that spiritual experience is both empowering him to write, but also for him to better understand the revelation that is coming to him uh, from Jesus. So John is writing to seven churches in what you and I would now call a portion of Western Turkey. Uh, you see there on the map, he's on the Isle of Patmos. It's a very small island. It's actually a, a, a um, prison colony island. He is likely there, as he said in the verse. He's likely there because of his testimony for Jesus, that he stood up for his faith. And rather than be killed, he was actually put aside into prison. And so he's now writing to these churches, and you see the seven churches on the map. If you were to start with Ephesus and kind of go around clockwise all the way down to Laodicea, that was the actual journey that John was writing to and, and how the churches were communicated with. And John had very clear messages to each one of the churches. Um, uh, part of what I'll say to you, friends, is I can't cover everything here, but I want to encourage you to do our uh, midweek Bible studies, and also to seek out the information that we will provide to you in the TMUMC app, in the blog section, and on our church website, tmumc.org, on series study, where there'll be lots more information to help you. But those seven churches needed a word from God, and they needed to better understand that they could survive and make it through the turmoil and the persecution of the state, because the empire was persecuting people left and right for their followership of Jesus. So, as John is writing all this, uh, he's writing it in what we would now refer to as an apocalyptic fashion. Apocalyptic literature is very unique. It, it, it has several characteristics or qualities of it that make it hard to understand. It's why, in part, when you read the book of Revelation, it's hard to understand. You may be familiar with some other apocalyptic literature in the Old Testament, like the book of Daniel is an apocalyptic book. Uh, major portions of the book of Ezekiel are apocalyptic uh, courses. And then when we get in the New Testament, uh, all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, each have a chapter. Matthew chapter 24, Mark chapter 13, Luke chapter 21, all have an apocalyptic chapter. Go read those chapters and see how different they are in style and content and form. They are all kind of portraying the characteristics of apocalyptic literature. And, and here are some of those characteristics. The first is, uh, in apocalyptic literature, there's always sort of this cosmic battle between good and evil. It's why all this imagery that kind of speaks to war and devastation and destruction, there's a cosmic battle going on, and it's being described. The second characteristic is there's a focus on what's known as the eschaton. That's just highfalutin language for end times. What's interesting is, 
end times in these matters are not like literally the end of time as you and I know it, but rather the, the end of the current time, the end of the thing that we're going through, the end of the uh, persecution or the oppression or the beleaguered times, the eschaton is that ending of that time. The third characteristic is that, man, there's just vivid imagery. You, you, you get overwhelmed in all of the apocalyptic literature, not the least of which here in Revelation, that kind of describes for us things that just seem um, mind-boggling, right? But that's very common in these uh, apocalyptic uh, times. A fourth characteristic is a gloom and doom kind of persona about the current times. It's, it's very pessimistic about the current times. It basically says, golly, all of this stuff is bad. It's all wrong. It's all evil. And we need to get past it and beyond it, right? That's the message. And ultimately, that's the fifth characteristic is, is that ultimately God wins. God offers hope because God's in control. And all of this bad, evil stuff is temporary. It is not the, so the totality of what life is going to be, and you can persevere. Friends, that's the ultimate message of John's revelation. You can persevere. You can overcome. You can conquer whatever you're going through. Now, th these are the reasons why the book of Revelation can often be hard to understand. It's because of all this vivid imagery, all of this talk of cosmic battle. It, it gets overwhelming, doesn't it, when we read it? There's another reason that uh, the book of Revelation can often be hard to understand and why history will tell us that uh, we have lots of ways to interpret the book of Revelation. It's because over the centuries, there have become essentially four views or ways to understand the book of Revelation. Some of them will be very obvious to you, and some of them you may have never heard of before. So I just want to quickly go through them and again remind you, there is much more extensive information about these four views on the TMUMC app, in the blog section, or on our church website in the series study section of uh, the website. So here are the four views. One is called Futurist. This is the one most of us actually know and is the most common today uh, in the world. Futurist view simply says, hey, the prophecies described in the book of Revelation are all about events that are yet to come. So even in our world today, some 2,000 years after John writes this, a Futurist view says all of these things being described are about stuff yet to come things that have not yet happened. And in the futurist view, it is a literal rendering of all of the stories, all of the images, all of the events, all of the people. That's one view. A second view is known as the historist view. And in the historist view, the prophecies described are about the historical events that are taking shape after the destruction of Jerusalem and the Jerusalem temple in 70 AD. So that historical events like the Protestant Reformation or uh, things that happen with regard to some of the popes, uh, a historistist view says these are helping us to better understand what John is talking about. We often refer to this as symbolic history. A third view is what's known as the preterist view. And preterist is a funny word. Uh, it comes from the Latin word preter, which means past. And so the preterist view simply means, golly, all these prophecies that are talked about are actually, uh, they've all, everything was fulfilled uh, leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And so all, it's all done. Uh, the one exception is that chapters 20 to 22, the preterist view would say, is about uh, the ultimate resurrection of all people and Jesus' return. But the first uh, 19 chapters, according to the preterist view, says, golly, all this stuff's already happened. You don't need to worry about it. The last view is what most United Methodists view, most all mainline Christians view, Catholics, Orthodox Christians. It's called the idealist view. It's actually the oldest view. Uh, uh, it was developed uh, by Origen in the third century, uh, further developed by Augustine in the fifth century AD. Uh, and the idealist view simply says, look, everything in the book of Revelation is our symbols and they help describe this cosmic battle between good and evil. It is really an allegory, right? That things in the book represent other things. They're not talking about um, directly who that person is or what that event is. They are allegorical understandings, and that's the idealistic view. It is what I will take over the next several weeks, but let me just say, uh, any one of these four views is very viable. Uh, it, what works for you is what you need to take up, 
uh, but just know that I'm going to be addressing both in my teaching and in my preaching uh, the idealist view. So a part of what happens is uh, with these different views, whether it's literal or allegorical, you can see how, golly, we might have differences of thought. We might read something and you might believe one and I might believe another thing, right? But a part of what I want to share is that these signs and these symbols and these images in the book of Revelation are powerful and they have great purpose, not only for John and those seven churches centuries ago, but for you and me in modern times. So I want to walk through a few of the signs and the symbols in the book of Revelation because they are both what are so important, but they're also sometimes what are so difficult to understand. So one of the ones I want to talk about comes from chapter 4. And in chapter 4, we have a, a brilliant description of worship and why worship is so important. In other words, why we bow down to God, why we offer glory and honor to God is because it's important to recognize the one who gives us hope. Here's some verses from chapter 4. After this I look, this is John, and there in the heaven a door stood open, and the first voice which I'd heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit. There's that trance again. And there in heaven stood a throne, and with one seated on the throne, and the one seated there looks like jasper and carnelian. Those are um, uh, stones, precious stones. I've never seen them. I don't know what they are. But, um, uh, and around the throne is a rainbow that looks like an emerald. And around the throne are 24 thrones. And seated on the thrones are 24 elders dressed in white robes with golden crowns on their heads. Coming from the thrones are flashes of lightning and rumblings of pearl and thunder. And in the front of the throne uh, burn seven flaming torches, which are the seven spirits of God. And in front of the throne, there is something like a sea of glass, like crystal. Around the throne and on each side of the throne are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature like a face, like a human face, and the fourth living creature like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and inside. Day and night, without ceasing, they sang, Holy, 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 the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And then you just hear that. I've got chill bumps just hearing those words. Remember, at the very beginning of the book of Revelation, John says, Blessed are those who read these words aloud. So today and over the next couple of weeks, you're going to hear me read several passages that just kind of portray lots of good stuff. In this one, you saw a throne, and there's one on the throne, and that John refers to as Jesus. He's on the throne, which means he's the King of kings, and he's the Lord of lords. And you heard 24, um, you know, uh, uh, 24 ways. There were 24 uh, emblems and 24 people around, and 24 is a powerful number in the book of Revelation. It probably represents the 12 tribes of Israel plus the 12 disciples who follow Jesus. And what that means is the old and the new has come together and the one who is on the throne, who was a foreshadowing of that which was in the old and now is in the new, they've all come together. I don't know if you heard that phrase about flashes of lightning. That comes from a, well, the modern song comes from that very passage. We sing a praise chorus that has that chorus in it. And that holy, holy, holy Lord, I hope you recognize from a famous hymn that we sing as well. All of that, friends, is about worshiping the God who is in control of all things. And we need to better understand some of those images that John places in the worship experience. Over and over through the book of Revelation, there will be these powerful um, songs and litanies that are worshipful to own for us what it means to follow God. Now you move a couple of chapters in, and what we begin to see is what's commonly known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And those four horsemen are a description of when we give our faith over to the empire rather than to Jesus, destruction comes. And the destruction looks pretty visual as well. Listen, in chapter 6, a description of the four horsemen. Then, John says, I saw the Lamb, that's Jesus, open one of the seven seals, and seven is an important number I'll talk about in a minute. And I heard one of the four living creatures call out and with a voice of thunder, come. And I looked and there was a white horse. Its rider had a bow and a crown with, was given to him and he came out conquering and to conquer. And when I opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature call out, come. 
And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people would slaughter one another and be, and be given to a great sword. Then I opened the third seal, and I heard the third living creature call out, Come, and I looked, and there was a black horse. Its rider held a pair of scales in its hands, and I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a day's pay and three quarts of barley for a day's pay, but do not damage the olive oil and the wine. And when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature call out, Come. And I looked, and there was a pale green horse. Its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed with him. Then there were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, famine, pestilence, and by the wild animals of the earth. And that sounds nasty, doesn't it? It sounds horrible. And in part what John is describing, because what's being revealed to him by Jesus is when we hand ourselves over to the empire and we worship emperor, the emperor and the empire more than we worship the lamb, we move from being able to conquer the first horse to war, the second horse, to pestilence and, bad, and, and, and famine in the third horse to ultimately death. In other words, our soul gets killed and we don't want to do that. And so part of what John is trying to say to us is, don't follow the empire. Follow the God of all creation. Give yourselves over to that lamb, not the beast. That's one of the other images, of course, right? Over and over again, we seem to see this beast or hear about this beast in Revelation. And um, you get to chapter 13, for instance, and there's a description of the beast, which is kind of fascinating. Um, listen to these words. Uh, and I saw a beast rising out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and on its horns were ten diadems, and on its heads were blasphemous names. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth, and the dragon gave its power and its throne and great authority. Sounds like a nasty beast, doesn't it? Over and over again in Revelation, the beast or the blasphemous names, or these animals are often a reference to Nero or to Domitian. They are the beasts. They are the rulers that are causing all of the devastation and all of the pain and all of the persecution. And therefore, one of the easiest ways to describe them is to call them the beast, right? Now, numbers are very important in Revelation. Uh, everything from the number one, which is about God, to the number three, which is about the Trinity. Uh, four is about earth, like the four winds or the four corners of the earth. Six means imperfection. It's about humanity. Seven is perfect. It's completeness. Interestingly enough, seven is often sort of the combination of three, Trinity, God, right? And four, humanity. And, and the completeness is God pulling all that together and bringing it into uh, great fruition. Twelve, of course, is a great number that references either the twelve tribes of Israel or the twelve disciples. And so those numbers become really important. There's one number that virtually all of us know about and hear about in the book of Revelation. Listen, in that same chapter 13 where the beast is described, near the end of that chapter, it says this, This calls for wisdom. Let anyone with understanding calculate the number of the beast for it is the number of a person. Its number is 666. You've heard that number before, right? 666. Six, six. There's lots of imagery in all of that, but number one, it's a six, right? Six is imperfection. It's all of humanity, but this is three sixes. So that's about the Holy Trinity of imperfection. So another way to describe it is that number, that person, that beast is perfectly imperfect. They are the worst of the worst. Another way to describe 666 is to say evil, evil, evil. It's all bad, all wrong, right? Here's yet another way to understand it. Um, many languages, even English, but certainly Hebrew, the letters often were represented by numeric values. And when you add up the numeric value of 666 in the Hebrew letters, it spells Neron Caesar. How fascinating is that? So the numbers referencing this guy who had been leading the country, the empire, right? And overcoming and conquering Christians as well. The 666 
is a fascinating, fascinating number. Now, a couple things that are missing uh, that we haven't quite seen yet. One is the word Antichrist. Nowhere in the book of Revelation. Yet we hear it all the time. In fact, we reference it to the beast, right? Or we want to know, well, who is this Antichrist? Well, Antichrist is not in the book of Revelation. Never has been, never will be. It's not there. But it is in some of uh, John's letters. In 1 John chapter 2, we see that the uh, Antichrist is a fascinating description. In verse 18, it says, Children, it's the last hour. As you've heard, the Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. From this we know that it is the last hour. Continuing in verse 22, Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Part of what we glean there is the Antichrist can be anybody who denies Jesus, anybody who lies about the faith, anybody, in other words, who misrepresents who Jesus is. It's why could be a president, <laughs> could be a leader, but it could be you or me. We need to check ourselves sometimes in that discovery. Another word that's missing or image that's missing in the book of Revelation is the word rapture and the concept of rapture. Two things you need to know. One is the word rapture doesn't exist in Scripture. It's not in any book of the Scriptures, not in any language of the Scriptures. Uh, it doesn't exist. But the concept of rapture is actually a very modern, recent concept associated with the futurist view of the book of Revelation. And so I won't spend a lot of time here, but to say it's not described at all in the book of Revelation, but it is described in 1 Thessalonians. I won't read that for you, but read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. And in there, you'll see a bit of a description of what has come to be known as the concept of the rapture. But you got to do a lot of work to get there. And it's a concept that I think is created by humanity rather than out of Scripture itself. Well, friends, as you can see, man, there's lots and lots of visual imagery in the book of Revelation. Next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about how that imagery helps us to better persevere through the persecutions of life, the difficult travails of life, and to overcome by the victory of the one, Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Ultimately, this book will lead us from despair and persecution to hope and celebration. And I look forward to spending time with you these next several weeks as we discover those important messages from John in his revelation. Thanks be to God that we have that opportunity. Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, thank you for John's revelation. For it tells us truly we face difficult times and we can overcome because the one in whom we place all of our faith, all of our trust, all of our heart, all of our lives, Jesus. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords, the Holy of holies, who sits on his throne and who will help us overcome. Thanks you, thank you, thank you, Lord, for all that you offer us in and through Jesus Christ, in whose name we now pray. Amen. Hey friends, let me just say thank you to you for all the powerful and wonderful ways in which you are so generous week in, week out, month in, month out. Your generosity helps change lives and transform hearts. Thanks for making that real. Hey, if you'd like to make a gift now or tomorrow, you can always scan the QR code that's here on the screen, or you can text the letters T-M-U-M-C to the number 45777. Thanks for all you do to make ministry possible. Be
Online church family, we are about to share in communion together. So I invite you to go grab your communion elements right now. And while you're doing that, I want to tell you there is still time to fill out your estimate of giving for 2022 at tmumc.org slash pledge. And let me tell you why making a pledge is so important for us. We do so many missional and service opportunities serving this church, serving this community throughout the year. And this really helps us plan for everything that we'll be able to do in 2022. So pray about it. And on tmumc.org slash pledge, there's all sorts of resources for you to look into where you can be in your giving. So again, go to tmumc.org slash pledge, check it out. And now let's share in communion together. Well, friends, one of the ways we encounter God's uh, relentless pursuit of us is through Holy Communion, the meal of God, the demonstration of God's powerful and amazing grace in the real presence of Jesus. So if you haven't gotten your elements, I wanna encourage you to go get your bread and your juice as we gather together. And let me remind you that as we come to God's table, we always want to sort of share our burdens. We also want to help God know we're sorry for where we have fallen short. And so I invite us to make a personal and silent confession to God to acknowledge that we need God's grace and we need God's mercy. Will you pray silently with me wherever you are?
Friends, the good news is Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. As we gather around this table, we're also mindful that wherever you may be, that uh, that night in which Jesus gave himself up for the world, he sat at a table much like where you may be today, and he ate with his friends. But before they began, he took bread. He gave thanks over it. He broke it and gave it to them and said, Take and eat, for this is my body, and it's broken for you. When that same supper was over, we know Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks over it. He gave it to them and gave uh, thanks to God and said, Take and drink, for this is my blood of the new covenant. It's poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink it, Jesus said, Remember me. And so we do indeed remember the mighty acts of salvation that Christ offers to us as we gather this day to celebrate God's holy meal. Will you pray with me as we prepare our hearts and minds? God of all grace and mercy, we are so thankful for your son Jesus, for the powerful ways in which he helped the sick, lifted up the lame, embraced those who were ill, and helped those who felt separated from you. God, we're grateful for his merciful love that is demonstrated to us all. We pray in these moments, wherever we may be gathered, that your Holy Spirit would descend upon us as only your Spirit can. That having descended upon us and on these gifts of bread and the vine, that we may know the powerful gift of your love and recognize the real presence of Jesus in his body and in his blood. God, we pray that you'd make us one with you, one in ministry to the world and one in spirit with each other as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. May we be thankful for your powerful gifts as we join together with all who've gone before us and all who are yet to come at this heavenly banquet, proclaiming your rich mercy and the powerful love that you have to offer to all. God, this is our prayer, and we lift it in the name of Christ. Amen. Friends, the body of Christ, broken for you. The cup of Christ poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. We give thanks to God and we celebrate by praying the prayer that our Lord taught his disciples to pray together. Will you pray with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us on online worship. And if you want to learn about getting more plugged in to, to us, join us at tmumc.org.